So a way to, to skip the Lee, to skip the lie. Um, good morning. Um, this is going to be a rather long recording uh, as I'm going to attempt to cover all of the grammar here in lesson 28 um, for you in a single uh, single recording. Um, so um, as you need to, please feel free to pause uh, today's, uh, sorry, pause uh, the video and um, take notes, make uh, observations, um, try to solve some of the sample problems in there. Um, we're going to go ahead and have a phrase of the day, uh, actually two, and both of them are going to feature examples of what our textbook calls the locative case. Um, and it is indeed met most textbooks that call this special set of place expressions the locative case. Um, the two quotations um, come from two different time periods. Uh, Sallust, uh, a Roman historian who wrote about the war against Jugurtha, the Numidian uh, upstart king, and also the Catalinarian conspiracy. Sallust wrote about both of those topics. And in both of his uh, historical works, he makes the observation um, in slightly different language. Omnia aromae when alia sunt. Um, in the period of the mm, empire, um, during the reign of, uh, in particular, um, Dis, uh, Domitian, uh, and then after him, Nerva, uh, Juvenal the satirist wrote, Omnia aromae cum pretio, with an implied sunt. Um, I'm going to cut to the chase on these. Uh, both of them are expressing the idea that, well, uh, Rome is not a place where <laughs> morality and honesty uh, and decency um, should be taken for granted. Um, <clears throat> in Sallust's time, he was speaking about the um, willingness of Romans to accept bribes um, or to um, use bribery. Uh, to accomplish uh, their uh, ambitions. In um, Juvenal's time, um, he was satirizing the idea that uh, Rome has become a den of luxury um, as long as you're rich enough to be able to afford it. Um, not going to do much more with these except to say that in both instances, uh, the authors are using Romae uh, to say at Rome or potentially in Rome. Um, and these are uses previewing the locative case. Um, in lesson 28, um, we get a, a hodgepodge of three unrelated grammatical topics. Um, the first of which I'd like to focus on uh, are the forms of malo. Um, I've previewed this when we did our work in Lesson 25 um, a few weeks ago, that malo is the uh, greater triplet, if you will, of uh, wolo and nolo. Um, a one-word translation of malo is prefer. Uh, a long-winded translation is want to a greater degree. Um, a relatively simple translation is want more. It is a compound, uh, malo is, of magus, the adverb that means greater or to a greater extent, and wolo. Um, and that mashup is, uh, of magus and wolo is something that uh, we have previewed before. Uh, as I said, it's a triplet, triplet to wolo and its pessimistic brother, nolo. Um, all three have irregular present tense forms, uh, the indicative, the infinitive, and the subjunctive. But a quick reminder, um, once you move past the present tense, these verbs behave like third conjugation verbs. The processes that you follow uh, to form the imperfect, the future, and the other tenses are normal. Um, we do want to put the present indicative in the spotlight, and I'm going to quickly click through uh, a reminder of the present indicative forms of wolo and nolo, and I'll have uh, you find folks note once again that where the uh, firstborn triplet, 
Wolo starts with a VO, where it starts with VO, that form is subject to contraction when NOLO comes along, uh, the negative of the, the uh, triplets. Uh, known plus WOLO contracts to NOLO, but where the form of WOLO, um, irregular as it is, does not start with VO, known is uncontracted. So um, as you move on down to WOLOMUS, as we re resort to, again, VO, NOLOMUS is going to contract, and so on. Um, this pattern is going to um, replicate in a slightly different fashion um, with the triplet MALO. Where the original form of WOLO starts with VO, MAGUS, in its shortened form MA, is going to contract with the stem of WOLO. So MAGUS plus WOLO becomes MALO. But where the form of this verb, uh, the simple verb, starts with a letter set other than VO, in other words, VI or VU, uh, MA is just going to get added to that form. So MALO contracted, but MA WIS, um, not really um, a contraction that swallows a syllable, but just MA plus WIS. Similarly, ma wolt, but where uh, wolomus starts with VO, there's going to be a contraction, ma lumus, swallowing up the VO of wolomus. No contraction here, just um, a compound word, ma woltus. And on the final form in the present indicative, contraction or no? Yes, there's going to be a contraction. The VO gets swallowed and it becomes malund. So the meaning, uh, I prefer, want to a greater extent, or want more. Um, we want more would be walum, malumus, excuse me, malumus, and so on. Um, the present subjunctive forms also are um, funky. Um, as we learned with wolo and nolo, um, the subjunctives here involve the um, mood sign I. Um, it's not we beat all liar friars, it's just the, the mood sign I, uh, like on the verb be. So learning these present subjunctive forms um, is going to involve stepping outside the we beat all liar friars mnemonic. And for some, Wolo, Nolo, and Malo, um, the mood sign is just the letter I, often long, but not always. All right, other uh, tense mood combinations, um, mirror, uh, <clears throat> the third conjugation. In other words, once you go past the present indicative, um, we're considering a Third person singular synopsis. Um, once you move past Ma Wolt, the imperfect and the future are formed like you would for a third conjugation verb, taking the O off the first principal part for the imperfect, adding a long E bridge vowel, and then the bomb boss bot series of endings. Ma Let with one L forms the future tense. Uh, for a third conjugation verb, we take the O off the first principal part and add on om, ace, at, etc. Okay. And the perfect active system, whoops, I didn't want to cover that up. The perfect active system is formed as you would expect it to be. In the subjunctive, um, the present subjunctive is uh, special. Um, malim, with that I as the mood sign, whoops, that was a typo. I'm going to fix that very quickly. Uh, actually, I can't fix that very quickly without uh, making a big mess, but it should be ma lit in um, the third person singular, not ma lim. Uh, the imperfect subjunctive, the perfect, and the pluperfect are formed regularly, just as you would expect them to be. All right, moving along. Um, 
the textbook also wants us to review comb clauses. Um, I'm going to not give you lots of examples with the um, in Latin uh, at this point. I'm just going to review the four types of comb clauses. Uh, comb plus the indicative creates a temporal clause, uh, one where there's a relationship of time, but that's the only relationship between the two actions. So uh, I want you to imagine um, a fire drill uh, unannounced, and um, when the alarm sounded, we were in first hour. It's just a coincidence that the alarm goes off during that span from 7.35 to 8.25, okay? Coincidence of time. Um, when the verb in a comb clause um, <clears throat> takes on subjunctive qualities, um, or subjunctive mood, I should say, the comb clause uh, actually takes on different qualities. There's uh, an assertion with a subjunctive verb that there is some kind of connection some kind of uh, logical connection between the two actions. One of uh, the types of logical connection is um, an expression that there's a link in the circumstances between event A and event B. Um, circumstantial com clauses sound a lot like temporal com clauses um, because we don't differentiate between those two clearly in English. Uh, the Romans differentiated by the mood of the verb we don't have a separate set of conjunctions. Um, uh, we can use when or after or while. Um, occasionally we'll throw once into the mix. But after all had gathered outside, we took attendance. Um, I'm asking you guys to understand there is a circumstantial link. Uh, normally I don't take attendance except once in the class at the very beginning. But if we have a fire drill, I take attendance again, make sure that everyone is safely out of the building. Okay, So there's a link in the circumstances between gathering outside and taking attendance. Sometimes that link is really, really strong, strong enough that in English we would use a causal clause to translate it. Um, since the alarm was false, we return to class. Um, the conjunctions that you may use since or because, they're interchangeable. Um, but you can see that there is a, um, a cause and effect uh, linkage to the returning to class being the effect and the cause it was a false alarm or a fire drill. Okay. Final type of comb clause um, is the adversative or concessive comb clause. Um, I ran out of room on the slide, so the primary translation strategy is although. You may also use even though if you're boosting the word count in your term paper. Uh, wait a second, you, don't, you guys have finished your term paper. Uh, you don't have to worry about that now. Um, but if I said, although time was short, we nevertheless finished the quiz, um, there is a linkage between these two actions, but it's a conflicting, uh, an adversative or a concessive linkage. And in Latin, um, you guys are probably uh, working hard to remember the Latin word for nevertheless, also known as however. Um, that's tamen, uh, tamen. If tamen appears in the main clause in a Latin sentence, it's really kind of pushing you, um, the author is really kind of pushing you um, to understand that quum has concessive force in that sentence. Um, in the course of uh, the uh, translation or the reading, the Lesson 28 story, uh, we're going to be seeing multiple types of quum clauses. Uh, the textbook suggests that you go back and review Lesson 16, uh, and that's a good idea uh, if this review is not enough for you. Now, I need to switch over to a conventional PowerPoint um, for the last bit of this um, because I haven't had time to switch this over to a Google Slides format. Um, we're going to be doing a, an extension of our ability to talk about place expressions. Um, we're now going to be able to use uh, the so-called locative case to um, give expressions of place. Um, oh, that's a lot of places you guys should know. Um, 
I'm just kidding. You don't need to know uh, all of these places, but um, I thought I would uh, present it this map to you. Um, it's a map of Carthaginian uh, territory. Uh, yeah, we don't need to worry about that. Let's go ahead and push on. Um, when we are talking about expressions of place, uh, we have some familiar known options um, that you guys can use. Um, we'll be adding to them, but it's my habit to review old uh, related material before moving into an extension of it. When we are talking about place expressions in Latin, we have, in essence, um, two options up to this point. One is to use an adverb. Uh, adverbs are often very generic or vague, uh, such as ibi or hic or ubi. Uh, I'm, I trust you remember what those words mean. Uh, maybe pause the video and think about them if you don't know the meaning of these words as place adverbs. Um, but when we use in English here or there, or um, we use um, the conjunction or interrogative where, um, we're talking about very place in a very vague way, um, something that's very dependent upon context. If we want to get more specific, um, we have the option of using prepositional phrases. Um, there are a whole bunch of Latin prepositions, um, and you guys remember most of them, which offer more precise statements of location. Um, Prepositions, you'll recall, require their objects to be in particular cases. And um, this is something that um, I don't want you to forget about. Um, I do want you guys, though, to maybe consider a differentiation amongst the prefixes. Um, some of them express a place where an event occurs. Some signal... Um, place from which someone or something is moving, and others represent place towards which or to which uh, someone or something is moving. So there, there are broader, or sorry, there are finer subdivisions of prepositional phrases. We don't need to get into all of them now, but um, we do need to uh, recall the multiple uses of Latin prepositions in place expressions. Um, you, might, you guys might consider pausing the video um, to translate the greenish um, uh, adverbs or prepositional phrases. Um, think about whether you can do that. Um, it would probably be a good idea to pause the video, practice them in writing. Um, pausing now. OK, assuming you did and work these out, uh, you're prepared to see the answers. Um, I'm putting all of these in view at once. Um, I do want to notice um, that heek with a long I is not this as a pronoun or as a demonstrative adjective. Heek, not hick, but heek with a long I is an adverb that means here. Um, if you wanted to, you could also translate it as in this place. But the macron over the I is a significant thing we want to be attentive to. Okay. Um, with the prepositional phrases, I want to notice that um, the first uh, prepositional phrase is indicating place from which. Uh, I want to notice that the second prepositional phrase is expressing place towards which. Um, the last one, uh, is the only one that's indicating place where. Um, and um, that's not remarkable. Um, we've been able to do that for a long time, but there we go. We are encountering here uh, with a so-called locative case some new options. Um, and I'm going to first draw an analogy between how we use the word home in English uh, and some of the new Latin place possibilities that are coming down the pike. In English and in Latin, uh, both, we can use a specific set of place words that don't involve adverbs or don't involve prepositions, 
to speak about locations in any of the three ways that we've done. Um, place from which, place to which, and then place where. Um, in English, and to some extent in Latin, the this use of place words is fairly rare, which is why we're not talking about this in Latin 1 or 2, but we're learning it in Latin 4. Um, if you consider the statement, Lucy, I'm home, um, home is being used to indicate place where. It's being used without a preposition. Um, now, we do have the option of saying, yes, I am at home. I can use that preposition, but um, a lot of the time we'll just throw the noun home in there and understand that it's indicating place where. This is akin to the Latin locative case, the so-called locative case. Um, the students went happily home. Um, home here is used without a preposition to indicate place to which. And then criminal departed home just before the police arrived. In this sentence, home is used without a preposition to indicate place from which. Now, we do this primarily with the word home um, because it's convenient and easily understood to use it without a preposition, whether it's uh, departed from home or went happily to their home or they are at home. Just We just use home to indicate all three of those ideas. All right, here's where you might want to pause and take uh, pause the video as we go forward and take notes. In Latin, um, the options above that we've talked about, place where or locative case, place to which and place from which, also exist relying simply on the case endings of place names without Latin prepositions. Now in Lesson 28, we're only going to be learning the locative case. Uh, we won't be doing the place to which and place from which. That's put into a later lesson. But what we're going to need to do is learn that there are three classes of nouns and then three very specific nouns which form Latin place expressions without any Latin preposition. The three classes of place names are the names of cities or towns or small islands. Um, let me state the obvious here. This requires a certain geographical knowledge on your part or a geographical, sorry, willingness to learn geographical information. Rome is a city. Um, <clears throat> uh, Naples is a city. Um, uh, Tusculum, um, where Cicero had a villa, was a town. Um, Sicily and Crete and Corsica and Sardinia are big islands. They're not small islands, but small islands include places like Delos um, or the island of Salamis, um, where uh, Themistocles engineered the victory over Xerxes and the Persians. So, um, <clears throat> With the names of cities, towns, and small islands, one does not need a preposition. Now, there are three specific nouns as well. Um, domus, the word home. Um, it usually is a fourth declension noun. I know this is going to bug the heck out of you. But it's a fourth declension noun when it means more what we mean when we say house. Okay. So there are eight houses on the block. That's domus in the sense of house. But when I came home, or when I stay home, that, that's my particular house. There's, there's, um, there's, a, hmm, there's a difference in nuance to it. So when domus means home, it acts as a second declension noun. In these place expressions, domus is going to adopt second declension endings. Homus means the ground. Uh, you may or may not be aware of the term homus, not the delicious chickpea spread, uh, but homus uh, being uh, rich, uh, uh, loamy soil. Anyway, uh, it comes from the Latin word homus, which means the ground. Uh, not like Mother Earth, the ground, but actual soil. 
Um, and it uses normal second declension endings, even though it is a feminine noun. That might strike you as a bit strange, but um, given the feminine quality of earth in ancient mythology, um, maybe you're not surprised that homus is a feminine second declension noun. The third noun in the category is rus rurus. It is the origin of our word rural and rustic. Um, but rus means the country, as in like the countryside, um, where the Romans had an attachment to spending their leisure time and, um, uh, and also agriculture. Uh, rus rurus is neuter, um, so be careful about that. It's a non-I stem third declension uh, noun. Um, so these vocab entries are there for your reference. Okay. All right, let's get on. Oh gosh, that's that scary map again. Um, by the way, uh, if we were to be naming small islands, Malta is a small island. Actually, there are two islands there. Um, the Rock of Gibraltar uh, over here, not that you can see it on the map, is small. Uh, Ibiza in the Balearic Islands, Majorca and Minorca, these are small islands. These puppies are big. And um, some of you might say, oh, why isn't that a big island? Uh, the answer is uh, because the Romans didn't treat it as such. In any case, um, let's work with some of these place expressions in Latin. I know this is running long. Uh, be patient with me. But for the locative place expressions, um, the place where idea is going to be expressed in Latin using a particular set of existing case endings. Um, the textbook and other grammar sources call it the locative case. It, there really isn't a separate locative case. It is an existing use of an existing case in a, I shouldn't say, I should rephrase that. It is a new use of an existing case. Um, I'm just going to push right ahead and stop making generalizations. If it is a singular first or second declension place name, like Roma or Brundisium or homus, to use the new word. Um, their place where expression, or locative, simply uses the genitive singular form. So as in today's phrases of the day, romai can be translated as in or at Rome. Humi, depending upon the context, can be translated as in or on the ground. Now, some of you are going to be thinking, well, what if the word is actually genitive and showing possession or ownership? Um, you'll have to rely on context to make that determination when we see these place expressions going forward. Okay? Context is king, um, and you must bow before it when you encounter these place names and translate them. All right, moving on. There are a class of singular third declension place names. Um, they mostly are going to use the ablative singular form to indicate place where. So for marathon, marathonus, the ablative marathona is going to mean in marathon or at marathon. So in the actual town of Marathon, or um, we might say right at that site. Okay. Uh, Memphis, uh, not the city in Tennessee, but the Egyptian city of Memphis, um, is a, and actually Memphis in Tennessee also, uh, is a third declension singular place name. However, it's an I stem. And it's an extreme I stem noun. Um, what makes it an I stem? Uh, same number of syllables in the nominative and the genitive, Memphis, Memphis, two syllables there in both. So the extreme I stem ablative singular form, Memphi, would be used to say at Memphis or 
in Memphis. Okay. <clears throat> there are two important exceptions to this. These are Carthage and the word Rus, meaning the country or the countryside. These important exceptions substitute the dative singular form to indicate place where. And you can see Carthagony, which would mean in or at Carthage. Uh, Ruri, we would probably translate as in the country or in the countryside. All right, last slide, uh, I promise, and I know this is running very long. All plural place names, all plural place names, no matter whether the place name is third declension or second declension or first declension, use their ablative and obviously plural form to indicate place where. So all of these are going to come into view at once. Athenai, Athenarum, first declension, Pompeii, Pompeiorum, second declension, Gades, Gaudium. Um, you guys don't know where that is. Uh, it's the city of Cadiz in Spain. Anyway, long and short of it. Um, it's third declension. They're going to use their appropriate ablative singular form. So, Atenis in or at Athens, Pompeiis in or at Pompeii, Gadebus in or at Gades. And again, because these are cities or towns, they don't need a preposition in front of them. All right. That's the end of um, the really long-winded uh, lecture for today. Um, it'd be good for you to go ahead and move on to your assignment, um, and we will...